And joining us now on left, right and centre is a senior Congress leader, member of parliament, uh, Shashi Tharoor. Thank you for your time, Mr. Tharoor. First and foremost, the BJP's pitch against Rahul Gandhi is that he has insulted an entire community, that his remarks from 2019, which led to his defamation conviction and his parliament disqualification, is an insult, they say, to, um, OB, to an OBC community. Your response to that charge first. Well, that charge is preposterous, Sarah, because no one imagines that Lalit Modi and Nirav Modi, two of the three Modis he mentioned in that offending speech, are anything remotely that qualifies as backward. First of all, they're not backward by caste. Secondly, they're not backward in their own levels of income and lifestyle. They're living luxurious exiles in London. I think it's preposterous to say that these two people who have uh, taken their ill-gotten gains uh, into fugitive status in a foreign land and are living in the lap of luxury, to say that pointing that out is an assault on OBCs stretches common sense to the breaking point, Sarah. It makes absolutely no sense to say that. What is more, in Rahul Gandhi's remarks, he specifically said, in sub in sub being these three names, it was these three people that he was specifically referring to. He was not by any means suggesting that all Modis are thieves or all thieves are Modis or anything like that. <coughs> he was pointing specifically to these three individuals, uh, two of whom at the very least don't qualify for the designation of OBC or any kind of BC. So let's, let's, let's really say that that defense by the BJP is preposterous. But in the end, it all boils down to political narrative and which one will right. stick and dirty politics. So let me ask you, we have a combative Rahul Gandhi and yesterday he hit out at the Prime Minister over his disqualification and in a clever swipe used the Savarkar reference to answer as to why he doesn't apologize over uh, his remarks in London. But Mr. Thru, legally this is uh, quite a setback, isn't it? Because this could bar him from contesting for eight years unless well, the higher court overrules it. It, it. it is in this initial stage a setback. But the fact of the matter is that indeed an appeal uh, is permitted for the next 30 days. Uh, he's been given uh, to appeal and the appeal will take place, I'm sure, much faster. The appeal will, will certainly request uh, a stay of the conviction. So I'm hoping that we can prevent uh, though that worst outcome from happening. Uh, uh, we have good lawyers. We believe that the complainant has a very weak case. Um, as I said, the actual statement uh, lends itself at the very least to a more innocent interpretation that specifically reduces it to those three people so that a fourth Modi, Mr. Purnesh Modi, the complainant, uh, cannot possibly demonstrate that he was targeted in any way, shape or form. Um, and, and therefore, I think it's entirely possible for us to be able to win a stay of that conviction pending a more detailed appeal in the High so Court. So, is, so just to say that, so that's the first thing, that it is bad news, but that bad news can be tackled before it becomes uh, fully operative as bad news. But the second thing is also that it's been good news. There's been a silver lining to this cloud, Sarah, and that's come in the form of uh, an unexpected and indeed unprecedented level of opposition unity. We've seen, for example, regional parties in the opposition that in each of their states have regarded Congress as a principal opponent uh, actually come right out and, and, and stand by our side. You've seen Mr. Kejriwal in Delhi, Mamta Banerjee in Bengal, K. Chandrasekhar Rao in Hyderabad. These are not figures who have in the past been willing to associate themselves in any way with the Congress or be on, on the same platform as the Congress in recent years, and they have come out and said they are there with us. So that opposition unity could actually turn out to be uh, exhibit number one in the law of unintended consequences of the BJP's action. It could still boomerang on that. So according to you, this is a self-goal by the BJP. And I'll get to the opposition unity uh, aspect of this. I just want to carry on a little more about whether there's going to be legal recourse or moral high ground, which is what we're seeing out of the Congress right now. The court had granted bail, suspended the sentence for 30 days, allowing a chance to appeal to a higher court. So the Congress will be appealing because the BJP yesterday also, Ravi Shankar Prasad was uh, trying to imply uh, that you are on a weak wicket which is why we haven't seen an immediate uh, appeal being filed. Well, look, I'm not a lawyer to begin with. I'm not one of the Congress legal team, so I can't tell you uh, whether an appeal is to be filed and exactly when it's going to be filed. You all saw and heard a very combative and defiant Rahul Gandhi who said he doesn't even care if he goes to jail. He doesn't care if they bar him for life from Parliament. So, I mean, I, I hope that was not a hint that he won't appeal because as a Kerala MP myself, let me say that 
it would be unfair to the people of Vienna to deny them the representation True. of the MP they voted to with such a major, uh, massive majority. So I hope that there will be an appeal and I hope it will be heard fairly expeditiously. I mean, the important thing is that there are lots of precedents uh, for uh, this sort of uh, matter being appealed. What is shocking is there's almost no precedent for the maximum sentence being given uh, for an offense like this, which consists of one sentence in a much larger campaign speech in a political culture where campaign speeches involve far, far worse abuse, much of it perpetrated by the BJP. I've been at the receiving end of far worse than this one sentence of Mr. Gandhi's in my last three elections. And I think uh, it's fair to say that some of those who are most self-righteously protesting Mr. Gandhi's words have said far worse themselves in their election campaigns. You know, let's face it, our Absolutely. politics is not exactly a, a, a sort of uh, a kid gloves kind of game. Uh, we've heard some stuff from very high placed ministers and even the prime minister on the political hustings. So to have a two year sentence, which, by the way, is the maximum permissible sentence for this kind of statement strikes me as, uh, as somewhat unusual. And that, too, I think, suggests that we're not on a weak wicket. It's, in fact, the complainant who's on a weak wicket and the BJP, if they're enthusiastically supporting him, because the fact is that, um, that he has a weak case. He's managed to persuade one judge. Mm. In fact, the, the earlier judge in the same case had made remarks that suggested he didn't think there was much of a case. Then mm. the new judge came and he's given a very different judgment. There's every reason to believe that a high court judge would look at the matter with a fresh pair of eyes and see it our way. So, again, Rahul Gandhi, the Congress being very defiant, uh, making lemonade out of these lemons. But, uh, and Rahul Gandhi has updated his uh, bio on his Twitter account, replace member of parliament with disqualified MP. Um, yeah. But have you been cornered? And ironically, it's, you know, Rahul Gandhi's own brash act of tearing up the UPA ordinance that would have actually allowed a convicted MP to continue until all appeals were disposed of must be haunting the Congress now. Well, I think in that particular instance, Rahul Gandhi has never disavowed the standard principle that he took. So I don't think that that's, that's a, a matter we want to revisit. I would say very simply that as far as the law is concerned, uh, the law has every right to operate. And, and I don't think Rahul Gandhi, anybody in the Congress wants Rahul Gandhi to be above the law. But we want the law to operate fairly. And what's more in our democracy, we want a level playing field. Yes. You know, we're used to a democracy in which uh, opposition leaders are treated with respect by the government. And indeed, it's our duty to treat the government and its ministers with respect as well. That's how mm -hmm. democracies function. Uh, you can't have this kind of take no prisoners, holds no barred, uh, gloves off, bare knuckled uh, uh, assaults going on uh, on each other because it's bad for the country. But equally important, let me say to you, Sarah, is this is bad for democracy. Put Rahul Gandhi aside for a minute, put his statement aside, put the Congress party aside for a minute. Just ask one simple question. Can it be good for democracy that the principal leader of the main opposition party is either locked up or not allowed to speak in parliament or both? Or even if it's not the principal leader, you can say a principal leader of any opposition party, I'm willing to have that too. Would that be good? <coughs> to my mind, if we care about Indian democracy, every concerned Indian will say this has gone too far. Yes, so a sitting MP not allowed to speak in parliament, disqualified without a chance to appeal. What does this say about our democratic uh, institutions? That's the big question. But Mr. Tharoor, the fact is we are... Uh, unfortunately, in a place where we have uh, political parties where the, the, the policy really seems to be take no prisoners, uh, all gloves are off. What do you do when you're then pushed up against a wall uh, in this? Because what, do you, what is the Congress going to do? What if the Election Commission announces a special election for the Vaidnath seat? Well, we do have an encouraging precedent. The Election Commission did that in the case of the Lashudeep seat when uh, Mohammed Faisal was convicted. He went to uh, the High Court, got a stay of conviction, and two days before the by-election would have taken place, the Election yes. Commission countermanded. So even if the Election Commission acts with unseemly haste, as the Lok Sabha Secretariat seemed to have done on a Friday, within 24 hours uh, of, of this judgment, on a Friday afternoon, we see this disqualification being announced, um, when everyone knew an appeal was in process and the weekend was looming ahead and nothing really would have been operative till Monday anyway. Uh, if the election commission behaves that way, the same thing could happen there once again, I hope. Look, I'm not a lawyer, so I don't want to prejudge any of these electoral judgments. Hmm. But let me talk about democracy. Our prime minister has actually said 
to the G20 and in posters dotting uh, our capital city of New Delhi that India is the mother of democracy. Is this the way that a mother would, uh, would behave towards its own child? It seems to me that this is a brazen assault on democracy and it hurts me as an Indian Democrat. Uh, I have certainly uh, spoken with utmost respect uh, of my political opponents throughout my 14 years in politics and I intend to continue doing that. Hmm. To my mind, uh, when I saw that video of uh, Atal Bihari Vajpayee speaking of how uh, Jawaharlal Nehru had treated him when even though he was a ferocious opponent of the Prime Minister and actually told him, young man, you will be Prime Minister one day or how Rajiv Gandhi had included him in a delegation to the United Nations General Assembly in New York just so he could avail of some medical treatment, which in those days was not available in India. That, to my mind, was a kind of mutual respect that characterized our democracy. And that was the kind of way in which our, the conventions and practices of our democracy function. Mm. To see a democracy now where the government blatantly gloats over a, its principal opponent being locked up and disqualified is a very, very sad fall. Mm. And I think many Indians who don't support the Congress party or don't support Rahul Gandhi will agree with me that we expect better of our democracy. And that's why this Samvidhan Bachao Satyagraha is going on today. We are conducting a Satyagraha precisely because these values must not be lost. They're yes. far more important values than any individual politician, any individual leader, or frankly, any individual prime minister. Lastly, um, uh, let me ask you about uh, the, the BJP's charge uh, is uh, that, or they're trying to diffuse uh, the Congress's argument, uh, making the connection between Prime Minister Modi and uh, the uh, businessman Gautam Adani by saying that Congress governments have also worked with the Adani group. Look, that's fine. I think what Rahul Gandhi was doing is very simple. He was exercising his right to ask uncomfortable questions of the government of the day, something which Mr. Modi encouraged in a famous speech in 2015 or 16. He actually demanded that the opposition should ask him tough questions. He said that uh, in that everything and the calm cards of the government had to be questioned by the opposition. That's what he wanted. Well, he's getting it now and he clearly doesn't like it. The fact is that what Rahul Gandhi did was ask questions the government clearly finds uncomfortable. To my mind, the fact that, uh, that Mr. Adani or any other businessman benefits from government decisions is to my mind fine because, you know, we are the party of liberalization. We've stood for uh, the opening up of the economy and we want businessmen to contribute to grow our economy and create jobs for our people. That's what we want. What Rahul Gandhi was saying that we don't want is any sort of shady nexus uh, between politicians and businessmen that could involve a diversion of funds. And so he asked some questions based on data that he has put on record. Now, a lot of it I know has been expunged from parliament records, but much of it is available in the press, much of it is available in social media. Foreign media has carried some of these questions in numbers. It's not difficult, frankly, uh, uh, to, to see what the issues are that Rahul Gandhi has been raising. Let me say quite simply, I do believe that all of this could be effectively diffused if the government simply took the matter on head on, answered the questions that were asked, and then moved on. Mm. But ducking the questions, trying to expunge the questions when asked, and then trying to silence the MP asking them reflects very poorly on the government and sadly reflects very poorly on our democracy. Lastly, Mr. Tharoor, you say that this um, has backfired on the BJP and at the moment the opposition seems to be standing besides Rahul Gandhi. But the fact is they are suspicious of the Congress party's projections of Rahul Gandhi as PM. Uh, the, the, the opposition, though they need to stand together, is unable to do so because of the candidate of Rahul Gandhi as PM. How do you plan to no, overcome that? I'm sorry, Sarah, that's an inference. That's not a statement. The Congress party has at no point declared a prime ministerial candidate. And I would like to see the slightest evidence of that uh, from any statement by any responsible person in the Congress party. The Congress party has always said, whether it involves chief ministers and states or prime ministers of the center, that we'll come to that decision after the election is over. But the case for opposition unity is that last time BJP won, with 37% of the votes in 2014 and won with 31% of the votes. So the majority of voters did not vote for the BJP. Why don't we, instead of seeing that majority being divided 36 ways, because there are 36 parties in parliament today, why don't we try and get all those parties on one platform to ensure that that majority actually gives you a majority but of seats? In one platform under happens, whom? Who will lead that yeah. platform? Because there are many I contenders for the post and they're unwilling think, to let the Congress continue to... Uh, hold the leadership position? 
Look, Sarah, in my own personal view, and remember, I'm not a party spokesman. I'm speaking as an individual MP. I think that's a matter that can be negotiated. I genuinely believe that all the parties can get together and find a convener uh, of this gathering who is not the, the boss of the gathering, but a convener of it, uh, pulling people together for the purposes of coordination. But that's in this kind of opposition unity where you're talking about multiple parties, there'll have to be a lot of bargaining, a lot of give and take. And I don't think that any one party should insist on any God-given right uh, uh, to, to, to lead that process. It has to be a collegial one and a collective one. But I'm just a private MP. I have no role in the leadership of the Congress Party, as you well know. And therefore, I don't speak with any party authority. Don't question others in the Congress about my views. This is just my view since you asked the question. In my view, this can be worked out. All right. Thank you so much, Shashi Tharoor, for joining us on Left, Right and Center.